Justice Committee if you can do the needful with any ele electronic devices and any declarations of interest. Now is the time to do so. If not, um, apologies, all through has a, a meeting to attend shortly, so we'll be leaving during the course of the meeting. I don't have any other apologies at this stage. Um, anyone delegated their vote? We'll be voting today, I don't think. So, um, item two then, this is a single issue meeting, which is to get an update uh, around the victim's pension scheme issue. And the relevant papers are on pages four to three of your meeting pack. And also then there's a tabled uh, pack for members. So just to remind members, the department was officially designated as the department responsible for delivering the victim's pension scheme on the 24th of August. Uh, the committee agreed on the 3rd of September officials would attend a meeting to discuss what the department has been asked to do and how this is being taken forward and the anticipated time scales to set up and deliver the scheme. A number of other issues were raised during the discussion on, on the 3rd of September by members wishing to cover uh, during this evidence session and these are included in the clerk's memo uh, of the meeting pack. And as agreed, they were provided to the Department uh, of Justice officials in advance of today's meeting. Um, it was also agreed, members, at our uh, earlier meeting, the committee uh, would write to the First and Deputy First Minister, the Minister for Justice and Secretary of State, regarding the provision of funding uh, for the actual pension payments. And responses to these letters have not yet been received. However, at paragraph 9 of page 5 in the table pack, the Department has advised that it is the Minister's strong view that the scheme should be funded by the United Kingdom Government. Uh, the Minister has therefore met with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and Finance Minister to uh, agree an approach to the Secretary of State. A response from FMDFM to the Committee's letter uh, dated the 3rd of July requesting details of what engagement the Executive Office had with other departments regarding taking on the administration of the scheme and why the department was considered the most appropriate is also still outstanding. So that brings us up to speed, members, on some of the committee's deliberations. I'm going to welcome officials who are uh, dialed in uh, for the meeting via the Starley facility. And we should have uh, Deborah Brown, Director of the Justice Delivery Directorate, David Lennox. Deputy Director, um, Corporate Engagement and Communications Division, and Paul uh, Bullock, Victims Payment uh, Project from the Department. And you're all very welcome to the meeting. Um, it'll be recorded by Hansard, a transcript of which will then be published on the committee webpage. So, Deborah, I think I'm going to hand over to you at this stage to give us an overview of progress in respect of the pension scheme. Deborah? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on the progress that is being made in implementing the Victims Payment Scheme. Um, I'd like to apologise that you only received our paper yesterday, but I hope that you've had time to consider this. We welcome the opportunity to provide the committee with the progress that has been made following the designation of the Department on the 24th of August to administer the Victims Payment Scheme. A project has now been established and I am the senior responsible owner. I'm joined today by David Lennox, Head of Corporate Engagement and Communication Division, which also has responsibility for compensation services. David is the project director for the administration of the Victims Payment Scheme. I'm also joined by Paul Bullock, the project manager for the scheme and the previous head of compensation services. The Department of Justice is fully committed to the delivery of this scheme and our Minister has made clear that we must ensure we meet the needs of victims and survivors. Before I turn to the detail on the scheme, the committee has highlighted some specific issues and I will address those first, then turning to the detail on the implementation of the scheme. The committee has asked why a response was not expected to correspondence of the 18th of February 2020 from the Permanent Secretary to David Sterling, Head of the Civil Service. This relates to a period of time when discussions were ongoing about designation of a department to deliver the Victims Payment Scheme. The purpose of the Permanent Secretary's note was to offer views about designation in advance of a planned discussion being led by David Sterling involving different departments. TU was considering a range of implementation issues relating to the scheme 
and the intention was to ensure that those discussions were fully informed. The Permanent Secretary subsequently attended a meeting on the 21st of February, which was convened by David Sterling and involved the Permanent Secretaries from the Department of Communities and the Department of Finance, as well as senior TEO officials. The purpose of the meeting was to inform TEO's consideration of designation of a department, and so a response to the correspondence of the 18th of February was not required. In relation to the query about the correspondence from our Minister and First Minister and Deputy First Minister, a response had not been received at the time of writing to the committee. However, a response from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister has since been received on the 21st of August, asking our Minister if she was content for the department to be designated. And we can arrange to forward a copy of that correspondence to you if you would find it helpful. I will now turn to update you on the progress that has been made on implementing the Victims Payment Scheme and I will also seek to address the specific issues raised by the committee. As you have noted, on the 24th of August, the Executive Office designated the Department of Justice as the department to exercise the administrative functions of the Victims Payments Board on the board's behalf under paragraph two of schedule one to the Victims Payments Regulations 2020. Prior to that, as you're aware, the minister had volunteered for the department to be designated on the basis that the victims should not have to endure any further unnecessary delay. Following an allocation of 2.5 million in the June monitoring round by the executive to TEO, it was agreed by the TEO to provide grants to the Department of Justice to establish the administrative arrangements for the scheme. That funding has been made available for this financial year and that is allowing the progress to be made on a range of issues including the recruitment of the board members, other steps needed to establish the Victims Payments Board and the IT developments. The Minister has indicated to the Assembly that her aim is for the scheme to open to applications in early March. Work is already underway in order to meet that timescale. However, as I know you will appreciate, there is a substantial amount of work that needs to be done to implement this scheme. And it is a complex area and a magnitude of work to be done. And of course, we do have the unknown around COVID and how that might impact on our delivery over the coming months. The key elements include the appointment of members to the Victims Board by the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission and the induction of those new members. Development of the administrative processes for considering claims and communicating with the applicants. Finalisation of an IT system and its security accreditation. Appointment of a medical assessment service provider. Development of an assessment process and related staffing and training arrangements. Also ensuring that the Victims Payment Board agrees its governance and decision making policies including those for the exercise of discretion, as well as service level agreements with those providing evidence, identification and training of staff and securing of accommodation, and the development of a website and a communication strategies. I will expand a little more of those issues. Firstly, the development and the implementation of an IT solution to support the administration of the scheme is a critical work stream. The discovery stage for that IT solution commenced last week and will include exploring ways of accepting and tracking applications as quickly as possible. Officials are liaising with NIJAC on the details required for job descriptions, terms and conditions, numbers and complement for the appointment of members to the Victims Payments Board. The Victims Payment Board needs to be established to make decisions on the application form. That in turn informs the workflow processes and IT system that will support delivery of the new scheme, manage the administrative processes and ensure that the board has access to accurate and appropriate information to make informed decisions on payments. 
In anticipation of a formal appointment of President of the Board, the Lord Chief Justice has made a judge available to inform the development of the scheme, which is very helpful. Work has also been ongoing to seek to establish a medical assessment service and together with TU officials, there has been engagement with a potential assessment service provider on the design and development of an assessment methodology. DOJ and TO officials are also continuing to engage with all relevant bodies to scope out the processes for evidence gathering and sharing information to inform the assessment of applications. This includes the drafting of evidence gathering protocols, service level agreements and information sharing agreements for the consideration by the board. An important aspect of the project is the engagement with the victims and survivor representatives. Officials have already had a number of meetings with the sectoral representative group and those discussions will continue on a fortnightly basis for the foreseeable future. That is to ensure that the sector is kept fully informed of developments and has the opportunity to put views forward as implementation progresses. A communication strategy is also being developed to ensure that all stakeholders are kept fully informed. We also need to ensure due diligence and that everything is done correctly, that personal details are protected and that there are no issues with making payments at the end of the process. One issue that has been raised with us is the time scale for payments being made to victims. That will depend on how quickly all the necessary evidence can be gathered to enable a proper assessment of an application. Officials have been engaging with PSNI, Public Records Office and the Department of Health regarding evidence and information retrieval. It will also be a matter for the Victims Payment Board to confirm arrangements and timescales for making payments. Another significant challenge which will need to be resolved to successfully deliver the scheme is to secure adequate funding for the duration of the scheme. In accordance with normal government budgeting arrangements, TU has indicated it will make a request for the necessary funding set out in paragraph 9 of Schedule 1 of the regulations with the Department of Finance as the funding falls due. The Minister has publicly stated that the funding for the scheme should be provided by the UK Government and has committed to working with executive colleagues to help secure that funding. Last week, our Minister met with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and the Finance Minister to discuss how additional funds could be secured. It was agreed that the four Ministers will seek a meeting with the Secretary of State accordingly. It is difficult to estimate the cost of the scheme with any precision, given the uncertainty over the number of eligible applicants who may come forward, and in particular, the numbers with psychological injuries and the extent of those injuries. TEO officials are taking forward detailed scoping work on the potential number of applicants to the scheme, which in turn will inform any request for funding. As I mentioned earlier, Work is ongoing on scoping the staffing requirements to support the Victims Payment Board. The number of staff will be largely informed by the potential number of applicants to the scheme. Any staff recruitment will be in line with Northern Ireland Civil Service recruitment policies. Work is also ongoing to identify suitable accommodation for the Board and the administrative support staff. While further work is required, good progress has been made already on identifying an option for accommodation. I trust that this gives you a sense of the work ongoing to implement the Victims Payment Scheme. It is a complex scheme with numerous interdependencies and many operational challenges to address, but we are committed to the delivery of the scheme and opening of applications as planned. Although there isn't clarity at the present on the longer term funding, I wish to assure the committee that it is not delaying the work being advanced by the department to prepare for implementation of the new scheme. I trust that that is helpful and we are happy to take any questions. Deborah, thank you very much. Um, 
and that that is helpful and let me just kick off straight away with a, a couple of questions you, you mentioned um a judge has been made available to assist with this do we know who that judge is are you, are you able to tell us yes yeah yes the judge has uh we've been made aware about i suppose that's a matter for the lord chief justice to make that announcement um and i suspect he will make that in due course um it's probably more appropriate that he conveys who the judge is unless that position might change okay um we'd be certainly keen to know who that is um in terms of the IT requirements, you, you mentioned that being critical. Is this a, a new IT system that's having to be established, um, or is there existing systems in place that are that are being utilised or adapted? So this is a new IT system. Um, the TEO have been engaging with this department since October, um, having a look at the compensation service system to see um, how it was constructed, um, and we've been working closely alongside that. Um, I maybe let Paul Bullock say a little bit more about the nature of the IT system. Yes, thanks, Deborah. Uh, yes, uh, we have been engaging with TEO uh, and the IT developer over the last number of months. As part of the project team, uh, we have what's called uh, product owners. We have two dedicated product owners from compensation services uh, who were involved in the design and delivery of a new IT system for the compensation services. So. Uh, it, it's understood that there, there will be some form of reuse of the compensation services system, but what they will do, they'll maybe take a side copy of it, uh, so it'll, it'll not impact upon the, the, our business, our, our uh, IT operating requirements, but they're hoping, hopefully there will be some reuse because some of the workflow processes for, for uh, receiving and uh, dealing with applications are, are broadly similar. So, uh, although it's a new system, we're hoping that we can get some reuse of our recently developed system for compensation services. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the preparation for the applications being made, is there a, a specific approach being taken to when they will be dealt with, as in chronological order of when the injury may have taken place, or prioritisation of those victims that um, regrettably, maybe nearing end of life scenarios. Has it, has that been taken into account? So um, that will be an issue for the board, but we will of course provide options on how that might be taken forward, and that will be part of the um, process that we're laying out. Yeah. Uh, and some some of the issues we could consider, Chair, as I uh, mentioned, about maybe somebody who has a terminal illness. Uh, maybe age profile of the victim as well, and maybe other individual circumstances. So we will be discussing that with the president and the board members to get agreement as to uh, the best way forward to prioritise applications. Okay, in terms of the, the 2.5 million, um, is that going to be sufficient um, for getting the, this project up and running? And is there any indication at this stage of what the ongoing administration costs could be once established? So at this stage, we have put in place um, a number of staff into the implementation team um, and we are currently working up the, the requirements for that moving forward. And part of the process then with that implementation team will to look at what are the staffing requirements for the actual administration of the scheme. So we are working on those at the moment and that is the nature of some of the objectives within our project. With regard to the 2.5 million, um, our initial scoping of the costs in this current financial year would indicate that that will be sufficient to cover the costs incurred by DOJ um, and TEO. Okay, um, and you, you've got a preferred accommodation identified, uh, is that correct? Yes, we have one at the moment and we're just working through some of, the, some of those particular requirements that we have for that accommodation. Um, and we were hoping that we would be securing that and having it available in the next number of months. Okay, and if there was any one issue that you regarded as the biggest risk to not delivering this in the time frame um, that's already been indicated around March, what, what would that risk be? So within the, the, the programme timeline, there are a, a number of, of interdependencies, as I think we've outlined um, in, in our opening remarks. Um, we obviously need the board in place to help inform the processes, which in turn then influences the, the nature of the design of the IT system. 
Um, and so all of those are interconnected and if one just slips then it has a knock on effect on another. But based on the assumptions that we have made, we believe that we should be able to open for applications um, at the start of March. However, um, in the current climate of COVID, um, it is difficult to know um, what implications that could have and could cause some delays. But of course, we are making sure that we are ready um, to work remotely um, and to have all of those systems in place to do so. Okay, okay. Th thank you for those answers to my questions. Um, Linda Dillon and then Gordon Dunn. Thank you very much, Deborah, and, and to your officials for coming to the committee today. I do hope at some stage, and I think we're quite early on in the process, so this probably wasn't the right time, but I would like at some stage that the Minister would also come in relation to this issue. Um, I have a couple of questions. Just have the criteria in relation to the board been, has that been decided upon, Deborah? So, with regard to the board, um, David um, has been working very closely with NIDAC um, and working on job descriptions, and I'll maybe let him say a little bit more about that. Yeah, that, that work is, is well advanced. Um, hopefully, over the next week or so, we should hopefully try and settle on, on the job descriptions in terms, in terms of conditions. The panel members are made up of many of legal and ordinary members. Um, so if we can, over the next week or two, get those signed off, that then allows NIJAC to proceed to make the appointments. So they're nearly there, and we just have to finalise a few details. Um, we have a meeting scheduled later this week with the Victim Secular Group, and we would hope certainly to share the job description with them all the well, if not this week, certainly shortly thereafter. Okay, I'm glad to hear it'll be shared with the, the groups and I would like to think that if they have any real issues with it that that will be taken on board rather than they're being shown it and that's what it is and there you go because I think there should be there should be as we fought for in relation to HIA there should be co-design with with the groups and, and the victims themselves just also in relation then to the medical services you talked about um the medical services assessment and that there is has been some conversation around who might do that. As we know, there are major issues with medical assessment services in relation to current benefits that we have around PIP and around ESA and other benefits. Um, I know that there are very different but equally as concerning issues around the um, police injured scheme, injury on duty rather scheme. So for me, this is a really vital element. And I'm just wondering, something that isn't built in to other assessments is that it would be automatic that your medical records would be requested. And generally, this causes a great deal of, it causes a lot of issues because what will happen is the the department will say, well, we don't request it, and the medical assessment services say, we don't request it, and you have to request it yourself. And then GPs are saying, we can't do it, or you'll have to pay for it. So there needs to be something put in place to ensure that the medical records are requested, because for me, they're a vital component. And I also, around the medical assessment services, would like to know, will they have specific expertise around post-traumatic stress? Because a decision has been taken that this will include psychological injury and the level of psychological in injury has been reduced dramatically by the British government. So I'm wondering how they will assess the psychological injury. And again, I know from dealing with other benefits and the medical assessment services that when it comes to any type of mental health issue, they have a very poor record. So for these people who potentially will be very, very severely psychologically damaged and will have very specific issues that if you don't understand what they've been through, you could really find it difficult to assess what, their psychological, what the psychological impact is. I think that that could create major issues in the road ahead. And for me, that's where we could come up against some, some real complications around this. So for, it's very important to get that right. Um, and then just my last point, but to be fair, I think it's more of a one for the Justice Minister and I, and I think I'll maybe just hold back and, and put it to the Minister herself. I don't think it's it's one really for yourselves. Um, 
I would be happy enough to just get responses to those questions for now, Chair. Okay, Linda. Thank you. Deborah. Okay, so thank you. Um, on the issue um, of, the, of the medical assessments, of course, I mean we are we are engaging with with a, a potential medical assessor at the moment through TEO, um, and those points that you've made, we're trying to learn lessons um, from from previous um, schemes and to ensure that some of those issues that you have raised um, cannot reoccur and that we are managing those. With regard to the specific expertise, of course, again, those will be certain things that we'll be looking at and making sure that the medical assessor can provide those. Um, and maybe just to ask David, just to say a few bits, um, he has been engaging with TEO um, on the medical assessor over the last week or so. Yeah, uh, we have some of the concerns around the medical assessment process and that, that service. Um, we're trying to, and certainly TEO have as well, but we're very keen that we learn from previous experiences as much as we possibly can. Um, so one of the users of those services has been Department for Communities, so we have already engaged with them to try and pick up whatever learning we can of their experiences. Um, I think Deborah's point is, is well made. Um, we've had a, a workshop with uh, the potential provider and another one is arranged around, this is probably a bit different from what they've used them before, um, so that's all has to work through as part of the process and as we scope out the actual service. Um, your point as well about the medical records, I think we can take that away and have a look at that as part of the design process because we are in the design stage so we have the opportunity to try and shape some of this. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what is actually feasible um, but certainly happy to take that into consideration. I'm sorry Chair, just, just to make a quick point, a number of the groups would actually um, already have services in place where they help those who use their their organisation with their benefits. So they too would be would be a very useful tool to you in terms of of designing this in a way that will will really work for everybody. And I mean I genuinely mean that that it will not allow those who are trying to um, claim that shouldn't be eligible to, to slip through, but will equally ensure that those who maybe just have difficulties in explaining what their issues are will be able to be supported properly through the process. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and TEO is certainly engaging as part of that uh, service too, so they will, victims groups and probably victims as well, will get support whenever they are making applications, so that's part of TEO, we're commissioning that because they've got the policy lead in that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Linda. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Deborah, and you, to you and your staff for updating us today. It is a multi-million pound scheme and obviously the cost will escalate as time goes on. Um, can you give us assurance that there are proper project management principles in place here to manage this uh, pro to manage this scheme? I'm thinking of processes of approval, uh, stage process, um, as the project advances and obviously there needs to be audit and evaluation. Those type of uh, principles I think are key. And I think we'd like an assurance that they will be in place from our experience over the years within the Assembly. Uh, I'm sorry, you're breaking up and we can't quite hear you very clearly. I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that? Yeah, <laughs> basically what I'm looking for right. is an assurance that the project management scheme is in place to manage the project, which is a multi-million pound scheme. And I've said yeah. the, the cost will escalate as time goes on. So I'm looking at yeah. assurance that those principles are there in relation yeah. to, to the design, obviously the approval stages and yeah. audit and evaluation and management review. All those good principles should be in place. Yeah. Give us an assurance that that sure. will be the case. Okay, so um, we've, we've established our own project, which is about implementing, Im implementing the, the administration of the scheme. So we have our, our project board, we have our PID, we have our risk register, we have our list of tasks that have to be done at certain points, and that we will keep that under regular review. So we have those governance structures in place. TEO has a, an oversight group, um, which involves them, ourselves, um, and another of a, a number of other key stakeholders, which then looks at, at that umbrella level. TEO are responsible for the business case um, and for the associated approvals around the business case. So the business case for the 2.5 million and the business case for the wider scheme. Um, TEO um, are working through both those business cases at the moment, the larger one obviously being about the actual payments themselves. Um, and the big issue at the moment is, as you say, is scoping um, the level of funding that's going to be um, required 
over the period of this scheme, which will of course will be dependent upon the number of applicants. That business case should give us some sort of a range um, and that range will allow the bid to be placed with Treasury on the amount that is needed. Um, the spending review is the opportunity to get that in at this point and give certainty over um, the next number of years. Of course, there's a high level of, of uncertainty around how many applications will come forward, at what stage, and how long each application will take to be assessed, given that there will be different levels of complexity. So within that, then we will keep the spend of the scheme um, under scrutiny um, and report to TU any variations against the budget and use the in-year monitoring round to um, secure any additional funding or surrender, should that be the case. Okay. You, you, you can give us an assurance then that the risk is an, obviously a risk there where you have two bodies working, you have the Department of Justice and the Executive Office. Uh, can you give us some assurance that those risks um, can be managed and there should not be problems uh, about responsibilities, I suppose, would be one of the issues. Who is responsible clearly needs to be defined and, and that needs to be monitored and, and probably audited. Yeah, so there is an, uh, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, which is in draft between TEO and the DOJ. That will clearly set out all of the roles and responsibilities. And the TEO Oversight Group has a risk register um, with clearly outlined um, responsibilities against it. We have our risk register in the DOJ um, drafted and we had our first project board last week and we will keep those under review and as you say we will be very clear on where each of those relevant risks lie and who we are dependent upon um, with regard to delivery. Okay Chair, one quick point just, are the relatives of deceased victims, are they able to make a claim? Yes, they can, um, so that, that is allowed for um, in the regulations. That is. And what sort of evidence do you think that they would need? Obviously, the medical issue has been well made earlier, and it's agreed totally that we need clarification on that about who, who actually gets it. But just on that quick point um, about the, the relatives, it, it's, I suppose, a bit of a grey area thinking about it, but have you any sort of thoughts about what sort of evidence would be needed? So. That, that's something we'll have to work through in terms of, I think, um, there's different types of evidence that may be available. And I think that's going to be some of the complexity of some of these cases, particularly some of the more historical ones in terms of what level of evidence might be available. So I think that's part of the process that will be worked through with the board, what they consider as uh, appropriate evidence. And, and it might well be that in places that could be limited, well, I think there will be some gains around that in terms of what we would expect or what the board might expect to see coming forward and then they obviously have discretion in, in individual cases. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Doug Beatty, the engineer Bradley. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the for the evidence. Um, I mean, it's really useful to sort of dig into this slightly. Uh, you, you mentioned that the scheme should be up and running for um, applications in early March. So what would, what would your assessment be if that is the case, when first payment would likely then um, be made as an assessment. You don't. You don't be held to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so of course there is there is the process to go through, which is establishing the eligibility for a payment in the first instance, then going through medical assessments, etc. The role of the panel um, and the deliberations by by the panel. I think it'd be really difficult to, to assess. I think it. I mean, we could go by maybe some of the timelines we have and some of the compensation claims. But I suppose it would um, probably be towards the end um, of the next financial year before maybe payments might start to go out. But again, it is just dependent on how quickly applications come in and the, the time that's needed to assess them. Um, I don't know if you want to say more of that. Yeah, I'll just uh, uh, add, uh, Deborah's uh, reference compensation services. It's really, when it comes to this here, it is really a very similar process where we receive an application we assess it to see if all the mandatory fields in the application form are, are complete. Uh, if not, that'll have to be returned. Uh, then uh, for, for the victim's payment, there's an eligi eligibility assessment. So as long as we have the uh, adequate evidence at hand for that, we can pass it to the panel to have it assessed for eligibility. And then on for, uh, on for the medical assessment. Once it comes back from the medical assessment, if there's any other 
evidence required, we'll have to go and get it. But uh, there'll be some cases maybe that could be turned around very, very quickly and others depending on uh, maybe gaps in evidence. Uh, so it's very, very hard to say. But uh, we'll obviously we'll be endeavouring to deal with cases as efficiently and as quickly as we can. Can, can I just jump on that? Because I'm not sure if I misheard you there and therefore it's my mistake. But did you say the next financial year? So if they apply in March, it'll be a year before they receive... That's what, that's what you've said, a year before they receive payment. And did I oh, mishear that? Sorry. Yeah, so if, if we're opening for applications in March, I think it'll be towards the end of that year before we'll see the payments go out. So maybe the second part of that financial year. I would, I would suggest maybe about six months might take as an assessment at the moment, but of course this has to be worked through. We are only designated a couple of weeks and we are working our way through these processes to try and see what exactly needs to be put in place. And at this stage we, have, we don't have a board to engage with to make sure that those processes are what that board wants as well. So all of this will be dependent on, on all of those things, so it is incredibly difficult. So any dates I've given are a complete guess. Um, nothing more than that. I, I, and I appreciate that, and I did ask you for an assessment, so I, and I did say I would never hold you to it, but, but that, that, that time frame shocked me slightly, if I'm really honest with you. But, but when we do manage the expectation of victims, can I just ask that, you know, we're talking about rolling this out by the beginning of March. When is the cutoff when you say, we're not going to make that, so we're going to have to tell these victims that we've not made it so when is that going to be? It can't be the end of February because that would just destroy them once again. Have you got a have you got a hard stop where you can say we're not going to make that deadline? So at this stage, um, as you can appreciate, we are just in the initial stages of our project. But one of the things that we're looking at is a contingency in the event that the IT system would not be ready to take applications in early March. And we're looking at what we could put in place that would allow us to do that at that point. So we are working our way through a number of contingency plans to manage that. Okay, and, 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 that's, a, and that's a fair one. But, but you can see the point that we're, we're, we're saying here is the way that victims have been treated so badly previously when they were expecting it to happen a, you know, two weeks later and, and then they were told at the last minute it wasn't. But I, I wouldn't want that to happen again, I suppose. Um, in March of next year, and that's why I raised the issue. So I guess you are alive to that issue, that we don't leave it to the last minute to say it can't be delivered on time, is that right? Absolutely, and we are meeting with the groups every fortnight, so we will be keeping them appraised of the progress, um, and if there are any issues, we will of course be, be sharing that with them to let them know if the timeline could slip. But of course, we are going to be doing absolutely everything that we can to make sure that we are ready for the start of March. And, and can I, I, so go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, let me just add to what Deborah said. Um, we are working with TEO as well in terms of bringing in some independent assurance around how our project is progressing. So we hope to have a project uh, review, which will be an inter external assessment prior to Christmas. And I think that would be a, a good measure for us to assess how we are in terms of deliverability. Um, so we haven't got too much optimism bias of ourselves. Um, that will not certainly stop us from, from moving on, but it will to give us some extra assurance that we are on a trajectory in terms of March, so we can take any corrective action at that stage. Um, and again, we will, as Deborah said, keep the groups up to date. But, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you. Can I, can I just move on roughly in the same theme? Because I think Linda raised some really good issues about uh, the assessment um, and how we're going to assess this. And, and I'm hoping that there's going to be an intelligent assessment of individuals. Um, uh, and when I particularly think about a physical assessment, if we just do a sort of catch-all physical assessment, if indeed we're going to do a physical assessment, you know, do we really think that's the right thing to do? For example, would the board be expected, expecting Paul Gallagher to come in, who was left in a wheelchair from the age of 22, uh, having been shot by loyalist paramilitaries in 1994, would an assessment board expect him to come in his wheelchair to prove he's in a wheelchair, or will there be an intelligent assessment uh, of, of victims? Well, of course, those will be worked out in the process that we are trying to develop at the moment, and of course we will accommodate each individual and their personal circumstances. Yeah, and just in the workshops that were, uh, were meeting with the, the potential assessment provider. Uh, so that, that's one of the things that we will be looking at to see uh, if all 
uh, assessments have to be done with a face-to-face -face meeting, whether uh, it can be done on paper, or whether it can be done remotely, uh, and where there's cases maybe where, there, where it's very, very clear to the assessment panel, they may be able to uh, work something out without putting the, the victim to any more distri uh, distress. But again, that's still, uh, that's still part of the work they were carrying out, and we have had two workshops to date, uh, and we're due, due to meet with the assessment provider again, and that will be ongoing. We'll also be engaging with the, the sector as well. The sector will be heavily involved as we move through this process. I, and I, I'm really a, a, appreciative because I know this is very early days, but, but I guess what we're doing here is we're firing issues in as well as, as getting stuff back from you. So we're raising issues that might appear again in, in three months' in three months time. And, uh, and, I, and I'm concerned when we use words like we can work something out, um, you know, because I have literally seen somebody have to go to an assessment to prove he's got no legs. Uh, and I don't want that to be the case for this. And that's why I raise it. So if I'm really honest with you, I, I'm, I'm kind of not putting a shot across your bars, but I'm just making you sure that, that you know that I'm, I'm alive to it. And I've rambled on enough, and I'll not ask the rest of the questions. Sorry, Paul. Sure. Yeah. I'll yeah. ask a I tiny point on I that I do issue. want to bring in Sinead and Rachel, and I will take a list of people because we have to stop at two, but I want to be fair to every member. And I, don't, then I, I don't actually want to come in again. I literally want to make a tiny point on that issue and not ask to come in again because it's on the issue. That's okay. It's actually a shot across the bow of the medical assessment services that you're engaging with that you need to do. If they're asking people like Paul Gallagher and others like him to come in, they're doing it on the basis that they're getting a fee for a face-to-face -face examination. So there needs to be something put in place around that. Okay. Bradley. Thank you, Chair. And I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I was uh, reassured to hear about sector you being taken into account. And I think the, the more transparency there is in the building up of this process, the more robust it's going to be. And it is hearing the voice of this committee and others. Um, that can contribute to that. But I suppose um, while I would love to get into conversations about is there an appeal process and lots of the mechanics, I know per perhaps that's not timely at this juncture, but what I would seek is reassurance, and I apologise for not being here for the start of the presentation, and this may have been referred to. Once it was established that the Department of Justice would be taking on this role, I was um, relieved. But at the back of my mind, there is this little bell going off that this is very out of step with anything that really happens within that department in terms of the structures and what is in place. And it is being built from scratch. Based on that, I wonder, has there been any sort of scoping exercise where you look across other departments to see if expertise can be seconded in during the formative stage of this process to make sure you have, rather than you trying to learn from others, that others step in and actually take a role in building this? Yes, yeah, so um, on our project board, we have um, experts internally in the department, um, including around information management and data security, etc. issues. We also have um, a representative from NIJAG and a representative from DSC um, to make sure that we are learning lessons from similar issues um, within those departments. Okay, because uh, and I, I, when you mentioned DSC, I'm very aware that they are a department that routinely pays out and, and recognise the payment system. Are they going to be with you throughout the duration? I know they're on the project board, but they are they... Yeah, we are, yes, we, we actually have someone seconded across okay. into our implementation team. And I'll maybe let, let Paul say a little bit more about this. Sorry, yes, no apologies. Uh, if, if that was covered, I'm satisfied to move on. Yeah. Uh, well, j just very quickly, uh, we have... Uh, uh, an expert uh, in his field uh, from the Department for Communities uh, seconded across to the project team and, and he's involved in the IT discovery stage at the moment uh, along with uh, some of our staff and the, the developer and I'm also speaking with uh, one of the directors to identify other sources where we can bring them in at particular stages in the implementation of the, the project and the scheme uh, so we have the right people in at the right stages and uh, DFC are, are very accommodating uh, working with us on that at the moment. That's reassuring to her. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your answer so far. I just want to suppose follow on from Linda and Doc there, uh, uh, Linda and Doug there, on terms of the medical assessment and the provider that you've been doing a workshop with. Um, 
you might not be able to answer this, but was it a case of going to DFC and he's, he's doing the PIP processes at the moment? Because um, certainly there is huge issues for people around medical assessments with PIP and I think every single MLA in the chamber will have had issues with, with that provider. Um, there's an incredible lack of transparency as well between the Department for Communities and, and the current provider and also calls uh, from the previous PIP review and I fully expect it to be in the second one um, of, of moving the medical assessment process in-house. So I would just like to share those concerns um, on that issue. Um, on point nine of our table pack, and, and Deborah, you'd raised it, um, in terms of, you know, there's this outstanding issue of who's paying for this. Um, we can have all the processes in the world set up, and if there's no money to pay out, um, then I think that's just a further kick in the teeth. Um, it says that there was an agreed approach um, at a meeting with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, and Minister of Justice and Minister of Finance. Um, so has a meeting been requested, and you'd mentioned a bid going to Treasury, um, is, there, is there a date for that, just despite it being obvious issues that they said they're not paying? Finally, the 2.5 million, um, you'd mentioned, just to clarify, is that within this financial year only? Um, and you'd stated that that is enough, but is there an expectation of more money then for processes and systems for the next financial year? And does the 2.5 million include all the IT system and the wages for the project board? Okay, so working backwards then, um, the 2.5 million is just for this year, and that is the setup costs, and um, will pay to will provide the payment of the board members once they're in place for the remainder of this financial year, and the estimation is that is sufficient. Um, moving forward, as we've said, this project will look at what are the administration requirements for the actual um, team itself to deliver those payments. Um, and that will inform the, the requirement on this. This is all built into the business case um, that TO are currently drafting, um, and the bid will be made through the spending review. But we did the minister did agree with the um, deputy first minister, first minister, and the finance minister that they would seek um, a, a meeting with the secretary of state to try and secure some money directly from treasury. Um, we don't have a date yet for that, um, but we hope that that will be very soon. Um, on the points that you've made on the medical provider, we are aware of all of those issues um, and are making sure that we're working our way through those um, to ensure that those are taken on board. Um, and we are aware um, that DSC are looking at bringing this in-house, but of course that won't happen quick enough for this scheme. So we need to have something in place to have this ready to go at the start of March. I don't know if there's any comments to say anything more. No, I think that's um, TEO initiated the process in terms of the medical assessment service, so they kicked off the, the discussions. Um, we uh, picked up those in working with TEO. Um, unfortunately, there's not an awful lot of uh, options out there in terms of that service, um, but I think it's important that we do learn as much from what the experiences are of the past, and that allow us then to help and work with them to make sure we ship the service that we need for support the Victims Payments Board. Thank you. Can I just point a clarification there, just in terms of the meeting with the proposed meeting with the Secretary of State? It said that it was to try and secure some money. Um, would be my understanding that the um, Westminster should be paying for all of this. So just wondering if that could be clarified. So, there, of course, we will want to seek all of the funding. Um, but we would want to explore other options in the event that the full funding could not be made available. Um, but of course the, the default position is that we will be seeking all of the funding. Otherwise we know that this will then end up falling to the Northern Ireland Bloc and have an impact on other critical services um, across the, the rest of the NICS. Thank you. Just to make sure that was the still the default position. Thank you. Okay. Um, members, there is a, a response from... Robin Walker, on behalf of the Secretary of State, that we received just an hour ago on this, repeating the similar theme about the devolved settlement gives funding through Barnet to fulfil all of the statutory obligations, including the funding of this scheme, but that they're continuing to engage with TEO and DOJ. So there's been no change in terms of their position um, as of today. So we'll put that into correspondence for Thursday, and members might want to pick up on it again at that stage. Um, 
Deborah, ju just to finalise on the, you, you're the SRO then for this setup project. That's correct. Yes. Um, and are, are you satisfied that, as the, the senior responsible officer, you're getting access to all of the relevant departments and their officials that you require to to carry out your role? Yes, we've had a good engagement with TEO, DSA have been very helpful, um, NIJAC has been engaging with us and trying to work with us to see how quickly we can take forward those appointments um, and I think there was a um, real commitment um, at the project board that we held last week at the need to make sure that we make as much progress as quickly as possible to make sure that we meet the timescales. And has uh, the department then backfill the different roles that you have had to relinquish or, or have you taken this on into addition to everything else? So um, we have brought in um, a few additional new staff um, and we have moved a couple of staff across um, from compensation services and we are in the process of backfilling those and hope to do that quite quickly. Um, I think um, one of the risks that we have in our risk register does relate to staffing because within the NICS, there are some supply issues at some grades, which will obviously impact on us. Um, so we're very mindful of that. But as I said, we have moved some people across from compensation. Um, in the current climate of COVID, um, there has been a little bit of a downturn in the activity in compensation services. So we haven't felt an impact of that yet, but that is something that we are going to keep under um, review. Okay. Members, are there any other questions members want to raise? Um, there's a bit of time there if members feel a few more issues to, to cover. Linda? Just one quick question, and again, it may well be one more for the Minister, but if you can give us any information, it would be appreciated. Are there any ongoing conversations or negotiations around the eligibility criteria, or rather the ineligibility criteria? I'm not aware of that, just what is in the regulations at present and the guidance that was then issued by the Secretary of State on the 14th of August. Okay. That's good, thank you. Okay. Just, just a quick one, if I, I can. Um, we, we talked about the, um, the, uh, the, the, the board getting appointed and going through the, that process with NIJAC and, and looking at the terms of reference uh, and their responsibilities. Do we know or do we have a rough time, bearing in mind they have to be trained in uh, to the role as well, so they're ready to go come March? Do we have a rough time when that board will be appointed? Um, a fear of you giving me another date. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully this time Christmas, but maybe if I ask David to say a few words. We're currently working through that process now with NIJAC, because they obviously, um, we obviously have to approve the terms and conditions that's falls within the regulations as part of our responsibility, but NIJAC work then through their processes. Um, we are discussing with them how much we can squeeze as best we possibly can. With a fair wind, we certainly hope that we would have board members in place in the new year, I mean early in the new year in January. Um, that will allow us then time to establish the board, uh, make some decisions, some sign offs and then get those people trained up and so on. So that's we haven't set on a final uh, time frame yet, but that's what we would certainly like to aim towards. Um, but we are you know, we are going into October now, so um, we just certainly now is the time they have to let the processes run through. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a fair point. I just think that, it, that that they need to be in place and be tabletop through a few scenarios so that they're ready to go come come March, as opposed to they're suddenly appointed in March and they're and they're hit with um, what could be quite a complicated um, set of of, of uh, problems in front of them. Thank you, Deborah. Has there been any work to identify the number of applications that you think may land on the board's desk in March, and, and then the capacity? to process them? You know, how, how many are you hoping to process per month? So we are just in our initial stages of scoping this um, and all of this will be dependent upon the assessment that comes out of the work that TEO are doing on the numbers. Um, so at the minute we're obviously trying to work up all of those figures in order as you say to know how many people do we need to help administer the scheme how many panel members do we need to be able to do the assessments, etc. So we, we don't have any figures on that as yet. Okay. Yeah, uh, 
There is a, an expert has been engaged and we are expecting uh, the, to come back with a range of figures, a, a lower and an upper range, at least that will give us some indication of uh, where we need to go with regards to staffing complement to administer the scheme and indeed the, the maximum number of board members maybe that we need as well so we can call them off uh, as and when we uh, need them to sit on the panels. Yeah. Okay, well listen, that's been incredibly helpful. Um, not just for me, but I think for the committee and to have this engagement. So thank you, and um, I'm sure this is an issue that we're going to to revisit in the near future and, and get regular updates from yourself on. So um, to Deborah and your team, um, our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, any other business? Then we're scheduled to meet at two o'clock in room 30 on Thursday. Okay, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.